to add any more? <laughs> no, that I'm, I'm good. Thank <laughs> you. You're good. Eh? I'm good. Thank you. Because uh, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Amen. <laughs> you say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Marina. <laughs> yes, sir. We, 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 we themed this year's Leading July Authentic Leadership. Right. Last year, we started redefining because to us, as we did the survey, we found that a lot of times when people hear the word leadership, they right. quickly go to politicians, if yes. you like. They think of the leaders in our politics. Right. Largely, that was the notion. Right. So last year's event was more of a definition. Correct. That took us all the way down to even family. Correct. Where an older sibling, all right, becomes a leader of a younger sibling. Correct. So having done that definition, We've come to a point where we said, what is authentic leadership? So right. we've defined. Right. Now, what is real leadership? Authentic. Yesterday, Bishop Gideon Titi Ofer was with us. Yes. Dr. Joseph Ofer was also with us. Right. We had a powerful and potent launch. Yes. You should have seen these two men going at the topic authentic leadership. Amazing. You know, they they, they actually zipped my lips. Oh, wow. <laughs> I would and, have loved to see that. <laughs> and that's not an easy that's task. That's never an easy task. No, 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 task. it's not easy. No. This young man <laughs> was created for what he's doing. I, I believe so. But we learned a lot from them yesterday. Fabulous. And we said next level. Okay, we've talked about the 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 broad scope of authentic leadership. Right. We thought it useful to get into the values that build authentic leadership. Correct. The values that make an authentic leader. Right. And as we read through a little bit of your profile, I mean, the listeners out there, the viewers over there, will say, Charlie, she's got to be the the, the right fit for this conversation. Marina, I've spoken enough. <laughs> it's your show. It's your turn. To what flew, Marina? <laughs> Thank you so much, Neil. I mean, I think it's such an important and timely conversation. Mm. And I guess, um, given the personality I'm talking to, <laughs> it's always good to sort of start off by turning things on their head. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's easy to talk about values, the things that drive the way we do what we do that's right or whatever that calling may be mm. but i think that when you you talk about authentic leadership and you're situating it in the context of values you have to start off by thinking about what it is that motivates you to lead mm. what's your objective mm. what's your primary objective that's... and i think that that's the context in which you can then build on the concept of values, values. and what it is that drives you in your desire to lead. So mm. what's the primary objective? And I think that if you look at all kinds of different leaders in all kinds of social and commercial settings, you will find that they have something that's bigger than them that defines their motivation for leading. So something that's bigger than them. Yes. As a so motivation for as leading. As a motivation for leading. Mm. So if you plan on being successful as you're cultivating your leadership style, you're thinking about your objective mm. for choosing to lead. Mm. It could be for social reasons, perhaps you see something in your community, um, something in your school, something in your home that isn't particularly pleasing to you as an individual, or you feel that there's some sort of imbalance. Mm. That should be a motivation to say, I'd like to take this up. Um, as opposed to, I see an opportunity to benefit myself personally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then that then defines who you choose to be, to be and the way you choose to approach certain mm -hmm. things. So without giving yourself the context about what your objective is for leading, it becomes more difficult to really define those sorts of values that can cause you to excel as a leader. So um, if you were to ask I'm sure anybody in business, anybody in politics, people who lead in their families, um, in their communities, at their schools, mm. there's an objective for which they're leading. Um, I think that if you look at it in, in our social cultural sector context, for instance, um, when we choose uh, a political leader or when we choose somebody to lead the PTA, there's an objective for which we have identified that individual and we'd like that person to lead. That person has their own objective and hopefully the objectives of the collective or the wider population weigh in more heavily than the objectives or at least are aligned to the objectives of the person who's leading. So um, if your objective is to do something for others as opposed to yourself and it's not because you shouldn't do anything for yourself, mm -hmm. I'm quick to point that out. Mm -hmm. You have to have an objective for which you and your vision to support your vision mm -hmm to join you in the journey to achieving that vision. You're going to have to get their buy-in. And so for each individual, each and every one of us have our own style of communicating. 
we have our own style of assimilating information. Mm. And so it becomes necessary to be consistent. And I guess that's what I mean with persistence. persistence. Every day, you're doing a certain thing a certain way. You're building a certain reputation. And so your ability to sustain that and consistently deliver results means that people can rely on you. Mm -hmm. Okay, And so that's where the persistence comes in. Every day, we intend to deliver excellence with integrity. Right? So each value is building on itself based on what? Your objective for leading. For leading. Right. Would you say in your experience, uh, just to ask that, observing our, let's call it society, a broad, right. in a broad sense, I mean society as a from safe school, sense. Yes. school to uh, home yes. to faith-based organizations right. to corporate life right. and also to our political space. Right. That the leaders that we see yes. have very clearly outlined objectives and I would add the word purposes right. to why they actually step up to lead. Neil, if you permit me, I guess I would reverse the question and ask whether in selecting and identifying our leaders, we interrogate their objective. Do we interrogate the objective before we take a decision? That this is the person, this is that, the would be person our that I would like to lead me. I'm a wife there were certain qualities I was looking for in a husband, right? And I needed to interrogate the person's reputation, the person's value systems, mm -hmm. in order to come to the conclusion that I want to submit myself to this person as my leader in my home, mm -hmm. right? We, if we interrogate the objective for which a person is proposing to lead, then I think we'll have fewer questions about whether there's clarity mm -hmm. because we ourselves have interrogated the objective for which that person is leading. If we don't do it, even in our homes, oh, I, you know, I, when I have the privilege of talking to young women who are thinking about marriage, marriage and so on, one of the first things I ask is, what's the objective? What's your objective for getting married, right? And then what's the objective of the person who's approaching you asking for your hand in marriage? If you're not interrogating those things, you will step into that institution not knowing what your role is. You'll think it's something else. You'll think that if you happen to be the breadwinner for whatever reason at a certain space or time in your relationship, therefore you have the authority to discount the person who you chose to lead to you lead in your you. home. So it, for me, it's really important that each of us as Ghanaians really interrogate the objective for which we are identifying a leader and the objective for which that person is proposing to lead. If they say they are proposing to lead us, what's the track record? What have they done? Uh, what are the things that we can point to, tangibles and intangibles? What's their approach, their value system? Is it aligned to the value systems that I would expect in order to produce certain results? Um, I, I think that if we look at our results, perhaps we would say we can do better. Mm -hmm. I, I always used mm -hmm. to worry as a student if I ever saw the comment from the class teacher, can do better. Can do better. I, I did not. I did you didn't not, like that No, one. I did not like that you, at you, all. You like good progress. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I want to see. So I, I, I can drive people a bit nut, nuts with my desire for, for perfection, excellence. for excellence. Uh, but I really believe that if we start to demand it in our individual spaces, it's contagious. And so I would say the question really is not whether or not the quality of leadership we have in our social settings is what we want. The question is whether or not we're interrogating adequately enough as a population, as citizens, the objectives for which we are asking people to lead. But that, that, that's more towards the, uh, let's call it the elect elective uh not, question, necess not necessarily. Or the, the choice of leadership in community question. In community. What about families? Uh, you don't choose your dad. You no. Don't, you don't choose your mom, for example. No, you do not. Mm. You do not choose your parents. Mm. You do not choose your relatives. Yes. Uh, those are divinely chosen mm. for you. That's right. Uh, but as you look at some of the ideals behind leadership, if you have somebody in your home, a parent, an older sibling, who is in a leadership position, you have two choices. You either support the vision of that leader in your home, your parents or your sib older sibling, or you do not. Uh, if you do not, then perhaps you have certain experiences that they have not had. And I would propose that 
simply by virtue of the time that you have had available to learn about human interaction. Mm. Perhaps one of the first ideals is not necessarily to criticize existing leadership, but to take away what is positive and learn from what is negative. So you may have a domestic situation that is less than appealing, but you have a choice to either break it down, break yourself down because of those circumstances, or say, here's an opportunity for me to rise above this, or to look at an alternative. Because there are lots of examples elsewhere in our society that you can point to and say, that's an example and a model I'd like to follow. So really it's about, as I said, interrogating the objective for which that individual is proposing to lead, to lead you, you, what you can take from it. I think one of the big challenges we have, and I'm Ghanaian so I can say it, as yeah. we, we, we have a tendency to be excessively critical. Excessively critical. Excessively critical. So much so that it's hard to build on the success stories. In fact, more often than not, you can't really hear much of the success stories. Quite a lot of what we see in our media space, unfortunately, doesn't really celebrate innovation. We don't have the opportunity to hear about exceptional young people in local communities who perhaps have taken up a leadership cause uh, simply because we're more fixated on what perhaps we'd be called more pessimistic news. And sensational news, as it were. I suppose. And so, you know, again, for me, if my objective is to inspire, uh, to encourage, uh, to motivate, then I'm going to intentionally look for those success stories. And that is not to say that I must not confront the negativity. The negatives, yes. That they absolutely exist. Mm. But because there's such an imbalance... Sometimes you wake up and you think the challenges are so many that I just want to stay in bed. I don't. Yeah, it's like I, I can't. And then you tell yourself I can't save the world, so exactly. let me be in my small corner. Correct. Like and so then you're you're you become disengaged, and I think that is the other element of not telling those success stories. I'm a big advocate for it because I think that the success stories, in some way, must balance out the challenges that we face, so that we know that it is possible in spite of. The difficulties that 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 confront us, Mama. Mama, what what if the reality is that we don't have that many success stories in in in, con in, in compared to what what you describe as the negatives? What if that is the reality? That the reality of our community as a people is that there's so much of the negative going on that is virtually drowning the positive. You know, Neil. I think that um, I must give all credit to my parents, Professor Dumont, the late Cecilia Dumont, for creating the opportunity and the platform for me and my brothers to be exposed to other cultures, other circumstances, other geographical locations, and really appreciate, first of all, the reality that they face also very difficult circumstances. I, I, I think that because we're so inwardly focused, we assume that those stories are not there or mm -hmm. our circumstances are far more difficult than others. And I think that is where I have the challenge because we, we tend to think that and insist that those stories really are not there because we're so overwhelmed with the significantly more negative stories that we're comp constantly bombarded with. If you look at developed country environments, there's always some story of perseverance in some way, shape, or form through very, very difficult, agonizing circumstances. There is always an opportunity to pick out something positive, some form of strength that caused that person to overcome something difficult. But because we're so constantly bombarded with all of this negativity, we have already preconditioned our minds that this is our reality there's not really much good news to sell out there. Meanwhile, there are young children in this country today who persevere, who pick themselves up from tough circumstances and make sure they get an education. And as a result of that education, they are able to pull others along. There are stories of young people in rural communities who have come out of those circumstances and gone back to those communities. We hardly ever hear those stories. I know a story of a young man who came from a community in which young children are compelled to dive. Yes, in this country. They're compelled to dive. Dive looking for 
oysters, uh, oysters ah, looking ah, ah. for uh, all sorts of things below the sea surface. It's a very dangerous thing to do for a very young child. He lived that way. He had the opportunity for an education. What did he do? He started a cause to address that social challenge in his community. Do you know about it? No, I don't. No, you don't. So I rest my case. This is somebody who came from very difficult, troubling childhood circumstances. And yet, he was able to overcome it. That's a story we should be telling to every young child in every rural community in this country. We should be picking up on the stories of political leaders who once were kayaye in the market. We should be telling young people all across the country that your circumstances should not define you. Otherwise, you continue to raise a crop of individuals who look for somebody to help them, mm -hmm. as opposed to believing that by dint of hard work, by causing themselves to focus on a cause that is higher than them, mm -hmm. they have an opportunity to, su to succeed. Mm -hmm. There are people from all over the world who have had similar Experiences, experiences and their stories are consistently told in rural America, in rural Europe, and so people believe that they can come from those circumstances and succeed and even overtake people who were once celebrated before them. So my personal view is that if our objective is to raise a generation of authentic leaders, as you said, yes. we will be looking at intentionally telling those success stories intentionally and not apologizing for it because we also face challenges every single society faces challenges very difficult challenges there are cultural challenges that people in Asia face that I mean are completely alien to us right and yet in spite of those circumstances they're rising above the occasion look at the, some of the issues that a country like India is currently facing. Yes. Issues around women in Gang leadership, rape, yeah. that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. And yet, they have a woman like India, India, India Nuru. Nu 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 yes. She's the CEO of Pepsi. Mm -hmm. That's one of the biggest multinational companies globally. In the world. That is where she came from. Those are her roots. Her success story, I can tell you, is told everywhere in every community, everywhere. She's an example of what can be achieved, right? We don't hear such stories. We don't know about women in, who are in industry in this country, who came from, I mean, Kate Papafio. She started out selling kerosene in tins. She's now one of the biggest cable producers in this country. Yeah. Do we tell her story? No. So I think that because we have consistently heard so many of the negative, negative stories, we are unable to even come to the awareness that there are positive stories. We need to tell those stories. But I will emphasize that it doesn't take away from the reality of our challenges. But I believe that those positive stories create an inspiration, a motivation in the mind of the next leader that perhaps nothing else you will teach them in a classroom or you'll say to them in church will will, will, will will do for them in terms of what they choose to do and what their moral compass is when they're choosing an objective for which to lead. So back to the objective question. Um, or, or, let, let's just uh, more like summarize where we've been so far. So right. we started from defining an objective yes. as to why what the leaders that we select, when it is that we have the opportunity to select those right. leaders, what objective do we as a people seek? Yes. It's that objective that should determine who we select. Absolutely. But the reality is that we hardly ever think about this objective that we have. <laughs> well, then it's time to start having start the conversation having and causing us to think more deeply. And actually, I think I'm, I'm just a naturally optimistic person. I think that's yeah, just the I mean, way Ebo, I Ebo, Ebo JB is a, a colleague at XYZ. <laughs> right. he, he joins me in the studio every morning on the Morning Express. Right. And when we're interrogating issues, and um, I keep pointing more at the positive side or the potentially right. positive side. He said, look, Neil, you're an eternal optimist. Right. He said he likes that. But for him, it's confronting the realities sure. whilst being optimistic that these realities are realities that we can actually so overcome. you can be a, a, an, an optimistic realist. 
Yes. Right? You so face the reality. Yes, you face the this is our reality. Yeah. How are we going to deal with deal it? Deal with it. We can't deal with it by, by being down in the dumps mm. or assuming that mm. that's all there is to tell. Mm. Um, and I think that that is a, a conversation that really we, 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 we need to push a little bit harder, especially when we're talking to young people, especially when we're engaging in our communities, in our homes. That yes, it's, 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 it's difficult. Sometimes the circumstances are very difficult. But here's an example of somebody who was able to overcome this. Here's an example of someone else who was able to overcome this. Look, um, many many young people in, in, in our country are always looking to, you know, Europe, North they America. Travel abroad. Yes. Yeah. They, they feel that that's where they have an opportunity mm. to dream. Mm. That's where they have an opportunity to dream bigger. Bigger. Right? Um, when we create the context in which young people hear stories that are positive. They see examples of people who've acted with integrity over time. They recognize that you actually do have a choice. You don't necessarily have to follow the route of somebody who's built quite a career in leadership but has a horrendous reputation, right? Um, they're unguarded in their statements. Mm -hmm. They, you know, fly off the handle. And yet that person is a leader. It's true. Mm -hmm. Hitler was a leader. He was. Yes. Um, he was actually exceptional at what he chose to do. to do. He had a certain objective for which he wanted to lead. And he had a core group of people who felt they were aligned to the objective. And it informed the kind of values that he lived by in order to achieve his objectives. Is he celebrated as an individual that we can hold up and admire and aspire to another level of greatness? Perhaps not. not. Obviously not. So when we're thinking about leadership, we think about the outcomes as well, right? So one of the other values that I talk about, apart from integrity, integrity excellence, excellence persistence. persistence, is results. Results-oriented. Because, yes, because your results will cancel every insult, every no, don't query. Don't say that again. That sounds like a good rhyme. <laughs> It sounds like a very good amount. That one, you can't just drop it and, you know, let, let's, let's go again. Your results will cancel, cancel every, insult. every insult. Wow. Because don't forget that if you are a leader, you are bound to face opposition. Mm. Don't get into leadership if you cannot battle. Right? You are bound to face opposition. You will, I mean, you, it, is, it is absolutely consistent with every form of leadership. You'll face opposition. Of course you will. Mm. Because people don't, some people don't understand your vision. Or some people don't agree with the values by which you are choosing to achieve your objective for leadership, right? They feel that there's a better way. And so they will oppose it. That doesn't make them necessarily your enemy or a bad person. They just have a different viewpoint, right? And so because you recognize that, your objective may not necessarily be to win them over. Because you're human, you can't bring everybody to your point of view. But you certainly can respect their opinion. And for me, I have found that those who are most critical of me, if I step past the irritation of feeling like they're just trying to hound me, mm. I can probably pick out something that will help me to be better next time. Mm. Really? Yes. yes. It's, a, it's, a, it's a path less chosen. But I think it has produced some very profound results, especially for me as a woman, as an African woman in leadership. I find that because there are more eyes on you, whether you like it or not, not, more expectation that you will fail because of the, let me say, cultural notion yeah. about women in leadership. More like a stereotype. In general, there's a yeah. stereotype. Mm. So because of that, I'm more acutely aware of different views and opinions. Where perhaps my male CEO colleague couldn't care less mm. what the opinion is of some customer or whatever it is. I may listen a second time. And that is not to say all male CEOs are like, like that. that. that yeah. There are some who Possibly. choose to ignore it. They can afford to do so. In my view, because of the difference in who I am in leadership, I push myself just that little bit further, further. to listen and to see what I can pick from there and say, no, actually, this is what I should share with you. So I hope that gives you a sense of what I'm seeking to do. Mm. Right. But in leadership, it is about the results. People want to see what the tangible outcome is of your leadership. Mm. If you cannot demonstrate that you have delivered certain re tangible results, 
not just financials, not just the commercial expected outcomes, but also the social cultural outcomes. So we want to see communities where every child has the opportunity to have an enhanced ex experience academically and non-academically as well because we want rounded citizens. We That's don't right. want individuals who are so stuck in books yeah. that they're not able to be objective in their engaging with mm. human beings. Are we getting the results we want? Then that means we have to go back and interrogate the quality of what we're looking for in leadership. And I am very optimistic. I was going to say I was, I'm optimistic because I really think that Ghanaians are in a space now where we will interrogate that really hard. Are we really? I mean, I, what, what, I th what informs that, that view? I think that, you know, like every other country, we test the waters to see the outcomes. And we are evolving over time. Mm. And I think that there is a growing crop of young Ghanaians who will ask really difficult questions. And if your objective for leading is exposed in the question and answer session, mm -hmm. it becomes abundantly clear where these young people will go. And I think that as we've watched things evolve in our country, not just in the political space, um, even in student communities, yeah. because of those of us who have the privilege of speaking to students quite regularly, you will see them asking many more questions about the objective for which a person is seeking to lead. So whether it's SRC, whether it is hall prefect, even in secondary school and so on, these are intense campaigns. And it's really about asking, is this person seeking to lead us with an objective that is aligned to what I would I like to see, see happen, happen. And what's the result I'm expecting? Then that's the reason I should vote for that person, not because they're handsome or they're beautiful or they're articulate or whatever we may think it is. It is because I'm looking for a certain outcome. outcome. If I'm not getting that outcome, and th that's where I think a lot of young Ghanaians are, young Ghanaian professionals, young Ghanaian students, we constitute the population size, the mass of population that everybody's looking at. Um, for those of us in business, it's all about the addressable market. And that's where the bulk of your consumer base is Business. going to be for the foreseeable future. So if they're not happy with the style of leadership, with the quality of leadership, you will see them take action. You spoke about integrity. Yes. Uh, which also boils down to, part, I mean, in part, truth. Yes. Uh, being factual. Yes. A lot of times the media in Ghana has been criticized yeah. as propounding theories or giving space mm -hmm. for persons who are not well versed with the facts and the truth to have so much time to spew out what's now being described as alternative facts. I call them lies. Right. But they've called them alternative facts. Right. And these go to inform a lot of the thinking of the young people. Right. Yesterday evening, I went for an event at Carbon. It's at this place called the Icon House, where, where loosely called Stambic Heights. Right. Uh, there's a group of ladies called Stembees. They formed a, an NGO, right. which is looking to encourage more women and girls to get into science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Yeah. So yeah. they had an event yesterday as part of their fundraising efforts. Yes. And I got into conversation with a couple of young people there. And Marina, I was, should I say shocked? I don't think I was that shocked. But it just fed into a perception I've built over time. Right. That in as much as you said that a lot of the young people that you're speaking with, and I speak to quite a lot of them too, but yes. this is they're looking to interrogate. They're, they've got more questioning yes. postures now. Yes. And their perspectives are, let me know why this person is asking me to place my trust in him or her. Correct. But this lady and gentleman I was speaking with were... Very well, very steeped in the polar, I call it the polar conversation. Right. And by polar conversation, I'm talking to us versus them. Right. The umbrella versus the elephant. Yes. The NDC versus the MPP versus right. the cockerel versus the all the other symbols that they use. Right. And it took almost 30 minutes for me to paint a picture to, especially the lady I was speaking with, and she's listening to us right now, <laughs> that it's not too much about who said what. Right. Or who did what? Right. It's about what was done, right. and whether it was right or wrong. Right. But she said to me that in her circle of friends, there's that polar conversation. Right. 
So could it be that in as much as they are looking to question and query, right. they still are more or less socialized right. by what we, our generation, and the generation ahead of us have, have, in my view, have created. Right. A polar country that sees things in the light of the political, and I'm using the political side now, right. dispensation I favor. Right. Could that not be affecting the clarity that they must have right. to build the kind of country that we want our children to live in? So again, I don't think that we are an, an anomaly. To be honest with you, we are, as, as Ghana. No, as Ghana, we're not an anomaly. There are extremely polarized positions. If you go to American politics, mm-hmm. if you go to what's happening in the UK with Brexit, Brexit if you yeah. if you if you look at the conversations around immigration uh, across Europe. Um, uh, other places in the world, people are very polarized in the quality of their conversation. What I am saying, though, is that because there has been so much focus on the polarization of everything, from whether it is I eat, I prefer kinky to wache or whatever <laughs> it is, the sad reality is that it is something that cuts across mm. the political dynamic globally. Mm. However, my optimism falls from the fact that after all of that rhetoric, after all of the yelling and the ranting and the shouting back and forth, inevitably, everybody will go back to look at the results. Perhaps in those circles, they have to take an entrenched position. But I will bet you when they sit amongst their peers, it's a whole different kind of conversation. Mm. And that's why you will see young people move en masse from one ideology to another. And it may not necessarily be self-seeking. It may be just because they've had an opportunity to really look at the results. Mm. Mm. And that's where I think um, our media institutions have an opportunity to be a lot more data-driven, right? So they're looking at the facts, They're taking time to build up the strength of their research function. So when you're having an analytical conversation about some quote-unquote political issue, Mm. you can be objective. You don't necessarily have to be labeled one way or another because the data that nobody can argue with Mm. is there. So if you distinguish yourself, Radio XYZ, as that radio station that will look at the facts, the data, not the nice, cute graphics and the infograms and the rest of it, but the actual hard data and the analysis that's been done by independent third parties. If we feel like Neil will not be independent, independent enough, enough, here's an opportunity to take an objective view of this, right? And let's be careful to say that because, again, everything we hear is so polarized, we don't really understand what's also happening beneath the surface. At a point in time, I really felt like in my interactions with young people, especially in more rural communities, there was a point in time in which I felt there was a bit of simmering rage, to be honest with you. Rage, yes. Because each time they're invited to identify, let's say, a community leader. So why do we have a lot of issues with... um, traditional authorities and communities, Mm. chieftaincy disputes, et cetera, and so on and so forth. A lot of the tension is driven by young people in the communities. They feel disenfranchised. They feel like they've been misled. They Mm. they feel like they've been misinformed. But if the media institution is regularly sharing facts, they can take an objective decision. Decision. Right? There is no way as human beings, that is why scripture says we are innately selfish, but there's no way as human beings we can completely disengage. But that is why I said if XYZ wants to be a leader, there must be an objective for which they are proposing to to lead. So if your objective is to inform with factual data that's been analyzed and interrogated in a way that makes sense for young people to understand and then take a decision, you can't force your opinions on anyone. Then that is the objective for which you exist. And that informs the quality of the research and the analysis that you do before you ever open up your mouth to speak at any sort of, of interview or forum. Okay. But if your objective is different, then of course th- you'll hear more of the rhetoric when you go to any, any, any social event mm. like, like, like what you just Describe. described to me. Mm. But I can guarantee you that when those two in, in individuals are with their individual party members, you can bet your bottom CD they are having tough 
conversations. conversations with their leaders. Why do I have to defend this? I didn't want to defend this, but I did because I still believe in the ideology. But you will see young people start to change their minds really quickly. Mm. Or just simply say, you know what, I will not even move on this anymore. Yeah, I'll not be part of this no, anymore. No, I'm not going to deal with it. And that's when we will, we will have real challenges. We have some challenges. Yeah. Absolutely. So we start by defining the objective, our right. objective. Yes. For elect or for, for deciding that so so and so will yes. lead us. What's my criteria yeah. if to, to make it easier? Mm. What what what, what would I want my, to see? Yeah, what would my ideal leader look, look like? like? And what sorts of results would that ideal leader produce? Mm. Right? Mm. Um, one of the things that I've been cultured to do by the people who have mentored me is to refrain from being abusive and abrasive to somebody else who's in a leadership role. Abusive and abrasive. Yes. And I, I, I use those words without apology because that is really the kind of language that we hear too, in our media yeah, space. Too much. It's unfortunate. If you think you are better in a leading proposition. You do not denigrate what you are trying to pursue. I think I should be the CEO. So I sit in the organization and I undermine the CEO. I bet you when you get to be CEO, somebody will be we'll undermining undermine you big ten time, times big over. Time, big ten time. times over. Because you don't know the challenges of, of, of what it takes to lead. You're not the one sitting with that heated seat trying to address all of the different individuals and the responsibilities that come with leadership. Mm. So you may have your viewpoint. You can state it respectfully, but firmly, right? Um, and for me, again, building that culture of respect for the leader, even if you completely disagree with the leader, there is a language, there is a culture that will endear you because your objective is to bring on board more people mm -hmm. who will serve in the vision you're trying to pursue, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that vision is supposed to produce results, results that are best for the wider group, okay? All right. So we define objectives for self, and then, therefore, we decide on who leads. Correct. Integrity. Yes. Excellence. Mm -hmm. Persistence. Yes. And then you came to results. Yes. And the, the phrase comes again, your results will, will cancel, cancel all your insults. Results. Yes. Any, what's the next value that you would look at in building an authentic leader? Neil, I think, you know, I, I want to use the word advisedly <laughs> because I, I don't want it to look like I don't have any sort of hope and belief in the pace at which we're moving. Mm. But one of the value systems that really pushes me is the value of acceleration. All right, or speed. Speed. Of execution. If yes. You like. yeah. I'm writing speed. acceleration. <laughs> yes, I like... You know, I, acceleration, I like... It reminds me of uh, <laughs> an equation that we studied in physics. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And I'm not going to I'm not going to give the the formula because I might not give the correct formula. <laughs> and then you'll be in trouble. And the only formula I remember of acceleration is F equals M A. <laughs> force equals mass times acceleration. That's very good, so acceleration deal. Acceleration equals force divided by mass. I see you were oh, paying I attention. Well done. Well done. Well done. <laughs> so you guys out there who said I knew this was science science matter, I'll like, tell you something. The reason so, why acceleration. the reason why I like the word acceleration yeah. more than speed is that speed is sort of not contained. Acceleration means you're building up. Momentum. We're building up momentum mm. to deliver a certain result, result within a certain time frame. Mm. And I believe that that is a fundamental for uh, those of us who are leading in our African space, in our Ghanaian space, because our situation is challenging, mm. because there are people who exist in our country who have no access to basic utilities. It is shocking, but it is a reality. It's a reality. It is a reality. This morning we talked about the court at Kaswa. Yes, I, I listened. You, you listened. I listened. Because the magistrate, that is a lady, yeah. is using a chamber pot. That is, it's, it's, it's indicative mm. of, again, what I, we've been talking about this morning. Mm. If we are taking the time to build up our momentum, we should be seeing certain results over time. time. If we're not seeing those results over time, we should be looking again at the criteria for which we chose a person uh, to, lead, to lead. Right? Leadership is a privilege. It's not a right. It is a privilege. privilege. It is a privilege. People have come together 
whether it is in your home, whether it is in your community, whether it is in your school, whether it is in your country. And they have come together and they have said, we would like you to serve us. As a leader. That is a leader. That is a leader. And if you understand from the beginning that you are being invited to serve, you see it for what it is, a privilege. And you handle it like you know it's a privilege. It's not a right. The moment we start to have that mindset, then it means that we're going to be looking at the outcomes, the results, and how that person acted. Did they act with integrity? Did they apply excellence every time to each and every opportunity that was presented to them to lead? They will because they know that the ability to pick momentum depends on how they act. If you choose not to act, then you may have a situation similar to what we find in, in the court that you, you, mm. you talked about mm. this morning. Mm. If you choose not to act, then it means you're going to discover to your surprise that there are still young girls who have to stay at home when their monthly cycle comes around because in the community they say girls are not supposed to cross a certain river. Mm. And the only way to get to the school is, is to cross in the river. In the river. Wow. That is a reality. Of course it's unacceptable. But it, because we're not looking for specific results, and maybe this is also a function of my corporate upbringing, mm. in the corporate environment, you don't produce results, you're fired. You're out. You're out. You're out. No questions asked. Mm. Because we're expending resources. We who have called you to lead the organization are investing in you. If we're investing in you, we have a right to expect a certain outcome. Right? But those of us who are being led also recognize that we are required to build a certain value system so that we can take up the mantle thereafter. For me, any leader who doesn't have a succession plan is no leader. But we are so scared. Of, I mean, when you mentioned succession plan, and I mean, by the way, just to remind you listeners and viewers out there, that you're on Authentic Leadership uh, Leading July Series Day 2. We are with uh, Mrs. Marina Shiada Ajo. Ajo <laughs> is actually Monday born, isn't it? That is okay. correct. Marina Ajo Treba. Uh, she she she's many things. Uh, she's she's one of many things. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to go too much into that. But she's sharing with us insights on the values that make authentic leaders. The values right. that go into authentic leadership. Right. If there are any comments or thoughts you want to share with us, you can share with us by WhatsApp line zero five zero triple zero double zero three nine zero five zero triple zero double zero three nine. You can also post your comments to our Facebook page. Facebook page Radio X Y Z ninety three point one. Indeed, as you're listening to us, there are those who are also watching us on Facebook Live. Same 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 location radio xyz 93.1 you should also send us your tweets tweet at us at radio xyz ghana like i always say we are happy to share those thoughts and comments with the rest of the listening world who are listening to us by the way on www.myxyzonline.com now we not talked about defining an objective define the objective for yourself you the one who is in a position or you you, you you have the mandate to select the one to lead you. Correct. Select or find that objective. Yes. And if you not found the objective, then you can't begin to choose a right. leader. Right. Having found the objective, you're looking for the values. Correct. I go through them again. Integrity. Yes. Excellence. Yes. Persistence. Yes. And results. Yes. Orientation. Yes. And results. Results bring to mind a phrase that a Nigerian boss of mine used to say. And I'll say it in the way he said it. And mind that then you can interpret. <laughs> he said, words are words. <laughs> and promises are promises. Yes. Explanations are explanations. <laughs> but performance yes. is the only reality. Yes. I think I should say an amen to that. <laughs> but for him, performance was the only reality. That's the only he reality. He didn't care what you came to tell him about Neil, about who. Indeed, it came to a point where there were a few of us in the company. They used to call us party boys. <laughs> I wonder we why. Loved, we, no, we, we loved our fun. Oh, Neil. There will not be a Friday <laughs> <laughs> where you won't find us somewhere in the city. All right, savoring the delights of the city. Yet, when it came to appraisal, we seem to be scoring high marks. Right. And so, first, his name is first, also Dumegu. I mentioned he's, he's happy for me to mention his name anytime because right. he taught me and my crop a lot. Right. He told us, look, Neil, work hard, right. work smart. But make sure whilst you're working smart, you're also giving it your all and your best. Correct. And let your performance, like you said, speak for itself. It people, has to. People will say all manner of things about you. That's right. But your performance is what will determine the case. Correct. It fits in with the phrase that you shared. This one I'm going to put on my... 
<laughs> status. <laughs> Your results will cancel all insults. Correct. So that's what we've shared so far on the Morning Express. For those who've joined us late, belatedly, I've tried to give you a quick summary. My wife has uh, interspersed it with her experiences, but that summary should help you. Okay. Please, when we say 8.30... It's 8.30. Stick with us even from 6.20. We come with the motivation. If I be with us from when Pastor Daniel Entry starts with us on the, on, on Radio XYZ right. in the morning at 4 o'clock. Right. It's there. Prayer starts. Then we have the 6 o'clock news. Now, let me promote my station. Please small. do. So, you've got 6 o'clock. You have the breakfast news. Then 6.20, the Morning Express team comes in there with Neil Armstrong. What a great. All right. Born quiet, but by calling. Look at what I do. <laughs> <laughs> and up to 10 o'clock, we are with you having a conversation that's meant to stimulate a different behavior. Right. Absolutely. It's, it's about stimulating different behaviors. Absolutely. So when we say authentic leaders, it's about being real. Correct. So back to the issue of being real. Mm-hmm. And we'll go for a short break soon. Mm-hmm. But we need to remind people where they were. Somebody has tuned in as wondering, where are we? You're on Radio XYZ, <laughs> 93.1 MHz, in case you forgot. Right. You're on Radio XYZ, 93.1 MHz, and you're with us on TV XYZ. You tune in at 8 p.m. You will see us. You are with us at 8 p.m. There are times where in leadership, you're faced with a challenge. The Mm -hmm. challenge is, I call it a challenge because it appears that in our context, a lot of people see it as a challenge. Mm -hmm. I don't see so, but people call it a challenge. Mm -hmm. Where you very obviously failed. Right. And you need to stand before your team and acknowledge your failure. Right. I find that quite a lot of people find that to be difficult. Yeah. What, why so? Um, perhaps they haven't really thought about building a culture of performance review. Mm. Right? So if you win once, you win twice, then you think you're cruising. And so you don't ever go back to say, is there an opportunity for us to do it better the next time Mm. or the next time or Mm. the next time? Mm. That is why if you heard me talking about my personal experience, I tend to listen to perhaps the people who are most critical, most antagonistic, um, most abrasive in their interactions with me only because I want to pick out an opportunity to do something better. Mm. So I quickly learn from that human interaction. So the next time I'm dealing with... so, So over time, I've gotten to be a leader that people like to dispatch to deal with people who they think are difficult to deal oh, with. Oh, I see. Yes. <laughs> uh, Madam, Madam Fix It. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I, I, I do actually have that nickname. I see. Yes. Oh, Madam Fix It. Miss Fix It. Yeah, but flesh and blood did not reveal it to me. <laughs> <laughs> so the story behind that was that when I worked with um, Newmont, there was going to be a big uh, gold pour. Uh, at the Ahafo Mine, and the president was going to be coming. So it was a big deal, about 2,000 people from communities, you know, government, non-governmental organizations, and so on. And I called the team that I was overseeing, Mm. involving protocol, security, et cetera, and so on, and I said, listen, this is the day. We've been working towards this for months. I don't want you to come to me with a problem. I want you to come and tell me this was the the problem, and I fixed it. So uh, unbeknownst to me, I became Miss Fix-It. So you come back and tell me that this was the problem, I fixed it. And that became my name, wow, Miss Fix-It. Wow. Because I really believe each individual has the potential to resolve whatever the issue may be. So if you don't build a culture in which you constantly review, in the, even in the, I think it's more difficult when you're successful. Because you assume it's going to be sustained. All the time. Yes, but for successful organizations, successful communities, successful homes, there's always an opportunity to say, we did fantastic in this area. Here's an area where we have an opportunity to do even better. Mm. Then you're looking at the ways in which you can sustain your success. And I guess because sometimes we tend to leave the... Um, in, in, in hard corporate environments, we call it the post-mortem. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah. What's the post-mortem? on the event that we just executed or the financial results that we just delivered and where are the areas where we can tighten up more, where we can do a little bit better. Those, I think, are some of the things that help to build a culture in which it's not so difficult if you do fail to say, look, we obviously dropped the ball in this area, in this area. area. These are my areas of opportunity opportunity as opposed to I failed. Here's an opportunity for me to improve on the previous performance. Obviously, if you're consistently failing, then there are more fundamental issues that you have to address. address. But if you've already built a culture in which you sit and you review, 
oh, we had so-and-so major event. These are the outcomes. I think next time we would like to do A, B, C, and D. You get better over time. So it becomes easier for, for, for leaders who have already built a culture of performance review when there are times that things don't go well, to be able to stand in front of everybody with integrity and say, I'm responsible as a leader. These are the areas that I think we dropped the ball. These are the areas that I'm certainly going to commit to to address A, B, C, and D. I would like to invite your viewpoint so that we build a more cohesive team and we're able to deliver the results we're looking for. So it's not difficult if you're building that culture right from the get-go. It's more difficult if you are king and master of all you survey and you feel that there's no room for improvement. When you're like a monarch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, that, that's one way of looking that's at it. That's one way of describing it. That's one way of describing it, yes. Yeah, because I, 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 I've hardly ever seen a situation in my adult life where in the African t- context especially, yes. somebody has actually obviously failed. Yes. And has refused to acknowledge it, number one. Right. And even share some sort of words in commiseration Remorse. with those that he, he has failed. Right. I, I faced a challenge myself once where I took a couple of decisions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this was when I was managing director of Hearts of Folk. And me, I'm happy to share this because these are experiences. We are talking right. about authentic, it's real leadership. It's right. about the genuineness of our intent. Correct. So a couple the of decisions. The genuineness of our intent, uh, exactly. Yes. So the objective. That's the objective. Yes. So I had, I'd, I'd taken two particular decisions that didn't, were not in the interest of the club. Right. So we had the board meeting. And I tried to stand my ground up to a point. I realized that, look, this is not going anywhere. Right. To cut a long story short, I had to resign. Right. There were so many things that were said at the time. Right. A lot of them untrue. Right. But when I was confronted by some of my supporters, I said, you know what? A lot of what you heard was not true. But a couple of them had some basis, in fact. Mm-hmm. And for those, I regret the decisions I took. Right. But I've learned from those decisions. And everywhere, when I made that remark, right. you were just like sort of accepted back. It was almost like magic. Absolutely. And, and for me, that's where that question came from, that why do we struggle to accept it and acknowledge it? Right. And then show that we are learning from it. Right. So that self-introspection that causes you to be aware for the objective for which you're proposing to lead becomes the compass that guides you. And so it's easy for you to say, I need to take two steps back and look at myself. Because inevitably, every leader also appreciates that you are responsible. Mm. There is nobody else who's going to take responsibility. If Inspire Africa does not succeed, I am responsible. Myself and Neil cannot be responsible together. It, every human body has just one head. Mm. Whether you like it or not, whether you, I mean, that's just how it is, right? And that head takes on the responsibility for your thoughts. That's right. Okay. You are responsible once you have accepted the mantle of leadership. And I guess these are some of the things that we don't really take into I, 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 I guess we don't internalize it is the way I would mm. want to put mm. it. Uh, we don't really appreciate that. Listen, because I am taking up this mantle of leadership, I am now responsible for ensuring that we arrive at certain results. Mm. So a leader like me can be incredibly compassionate, but also very, very focused on the results. If you are getting in the way of delivering the results, I will politely ask you to step out of the way. Or oh, politely. Politely. You wouldn't drive the person out. No, That's... because they may be useful in some other area. Every individual in an organization has something to bring to the table. Mm. There are some people who are extremely talkative, right? Yeah, yeah. Those are people who are good for communicating stop about the organization. Like stop, look at, stop looking at me like that. Man. Stop, they are very good stop at, making me feel guilty. They are very good at communicating <laughs> about the organization. Yeah. So those would not be people who would be good for security, mm, right? Obviously, yeah. They there are people who keep things to themselves. Those people are good for security. Their weakness would be putting them in a place where they have to engage and communicate. And mm-hmm. So every individual has something they bring to the table. Unless you're acting outside of the rules and the tenets of the organization, mm-hmm. you definitely have something to bring to the table. What I can't accept is any attempt to dissuade us from the path to producing the results. So as a leader, I would then have to take an executive decision. Mm-hmm. Is your presence building the team 
or is it breaking it down? See. And that is where, again, my objective is to produce these results mm -hmm. because people mm -hmm. are relying on me to produce these results. That's right. Okay, so everything else fades into irrelevance. Each person on the team has a role to play in delivering those results. Mm. So when I'm doing the assessment, I know that I am responsible. If we fail, the questions must come to me, to and you. rightly so. And I must be prepared to answer them. All right. right. So, but I, what I want to be able to do is always demonstrate that we are acting with integrity. Mm -hmm. So nothing that has been vested with us is gone to waste. To waste. I want to make sure that we are delivering excellence. So is it something that can stack up on a global stage? That would be my standard. All right, global stage. Absolutely, 100%. Wow. Because I think Ghana is a country that can contend with anybody globally mm -hmm. once we have set our mind in that direction, mm -hmm. right? So apart from integrity, apart from excellence, I want to be sure that I'm producing a certain outcome. Outcome. Those are the so results. So you can't argue with it because the result is there. They speak for themselves. Yes. For I, themselves. Don't, I don't need to be verbose about my achievements mm. because the results are already there mm. for everybody to see. Mm. And mm. because those results, fortunately, will inevitably weigh on other choices that will be made, I remain optimistic. That's right. Right? That's right. And because I know that there are so many challenges for which I have been called into this leadership. I must be continuously building momentum. Mm. Uh, in my role as GIPC CEO, it was important for me to outperform each year. Each year? Yes. You are racing against yourself, yes. more or less. So 2013 must be okay. 2014 be must better. be better. Irrespective of the challenges, mm. 2014 must be better than 2013. 2014 was a year in which, unfortunately, I lost my brother, but it was also yeah, one of the sir. most incredible years in mm. terms of my results. Mm. Why? Because, first of all, I think I felt a personal sense of joy that I could overcome the, that, grief that grief in order to deliver a certain kind of result. Mm. I make no apology for saying I had a tremendous level of support from the team at GIPC at that time. It was tough. Mm. But they were able to bear with me because I wasn't in top form. As a leader, I was not. I was a bit disengaged, I guess, right?